Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out on a Monday night. I'm Bill Brown with Brookings Mountain West. On behalf of my colleagues, Rob Lang and Caitlin Saladino, we are very pleased to have our first Brookings Scholar Lecture uh, and our first on a Monday night. So uh, experiment seems to have worked out well, although I hope nobody shows up on Wednesday looking for our usual lecture. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, we're also, as always, thrilled to be here in Greenspun College in this auditorium, which is undergoing some aesthetic and technical changes. Kudos on the new carpeting, which I think we probably wore out just on our programs alone. Uh, and as you can see, our colleagues help us videotape these lectures, so they'll be up on our website in a few days. If you or anyone you know wants to re watch it on YouTube, uh, they also get broadcast on local public television if you have insomnia at odd hours of the morning. Uh, but we are very pleased to have our colleague Aaron Klein back out from Brookings. Uh, Aaron's making his second sort of official visit with us. Let me tell you a little bit about him. He's a fellow in the Economic Studies program at Brookings, where he's director, policy director on the Center for Regulation and Markets. He focuses on financial regulation and technology, macroeconomics, and infrastructure finance and policy. Uh, Aaron previously directed the Bipartisan Policy Center's Financial Regulatory Reform Initiative, and in another life he served at the U.S. Treasury as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Economic Policy. Uh, prior to that, in 2009, he served at the ch as the Chief Economist of the Senate Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs Committee, for then Chairman Chris Dodd and Paul Sarbanes. Aaron's a graduate of Dartmouth College and the Woodrow Wilson School for Public Affairs at Princeton. Like all our scholars, he'll be meeting with UNLV students and faculty this week, teaching in some classes, uh, holding one-on-one -on -one meetings, conducting some research uh, with us and lo looking at future projects. So let me step aside and invite Aaron up to speak to us tonight. Thank you, Bill and Caitlin and Robin. It's a pleasure to be back here at UNLV. I really learn a tremendous amount every time I'm out here and I'm inspired by the learning and the action and, and the energy here on campus. Uh, and it's a wonderful environment. Uh, let me start this conversation and, and with kind of what I hope to impart and hopefully we're gonna have a little bit of an interactive conversation because new technology is fundamentally transforming how we allocate credit and how financial services ranging from credit cards to bank accounts to mortgages to loans to car insurance, insurance is another key component, and this is all going to be changed by this whole new set of information and technology. And that change should thrill and excite you because it provides an opportunity to fundamentally transform and create a more inclusive and fair system. That change should terrify you because it provides an opportunity for a credible amount of information to be used in ways in which could have deeply detrimental impacts on your life. After all, we need financial services to survive, right? You need car insurance to drive your car, you need to be able to, to access credit in a bank account and move money. And all these things could be radically transformed in ways that could be very good or very bad for you. And we have an era, and I hope to impart in you, that we have a legal and ethical dilemma and a legal framework from the 1970s that is not well equipped to envision a world with this new technology, right? We built the games and the rules of the road when there was more computing power uh, in, in a building, this entire building, there's now more computing power in each of our pockets. And so this is going to create a unique policy opportunity and also something that, that, that could go either way. So without any further ado, let me, let me delve right into this with the most sexy and, and exciting part of this all, which is artificial intelligence, which is the potential to truly transform, and I'm going to start with what some people say was the defining moment in AI, which was move 37 in a game called Go. Did anybody here know Go? Yeah. A few people, right? For those of you who don't know Go, it's an ancient Asian game 
uh, it's often compared to chess, but the, the number of computational moves is infinitely more. So for example, in chess, there are 20 opening moves that are possible. In Go, there are 361. And that's move number one. Now, um, there was a, an artificial intelligence program that did this move, and it's called Go 37. They were playing uh, one of the great masters. And what happened here, and I want to start with this because this is what's different about artificial intelligence. In this game, the computer did something on move 37 that made no sense. It was arguably, at the time, the dumbest thing anybody thought they'd ever seen. The live commentary of Go watchers thought the computer had malfunctioned because it made a move that nobody had ever seen before and a move that any teacher of Go would have told, thought a five-year-old would make and would have beat it out of them because it was so obviously a dumb move. It also freaked out the opponent because he'd never seen it. Turns out that move won the game for the computer and was viewed as a pivotal game changer in the fact that this was artificial intelligence. And I'm going to define artificial intelligence as being when the computer comes up with a thought that it never w could have been programmed to have. Right? That's very different than machine learning, which is constantly in there, search, uh, in which um, you tell a machine what to optimize and it learns different ways to do that. Artificial intelligence, machine learning. The third thing is called big data. And big data is just simply that. Lots and lots and lots of information. They say, I think, what's the statistic about half the data ever created in the world has been created in the last five years. That's of all of human history. We're constantly leaving digital footprints and creating new information and data. And we now have the computational ability to run all that data in through whatever algorithm you want in a price reasonable time frame for both time and money. And big data allows a lot of new opportunity. That is also something very different than machine learning where the machine is now figuring out how to use the data within parameters, which is again different from artificial intelligence. So we level set on those kind of three different concepts. All right, so with all of that, let me turn to how companies are using this information. I'm going to give you a couple examples of um, uh, as it relates to big data and machine learning, uh, you guys all know how your information, your email is being read, your Facebook sites are being watched, and you're getting bombarded with advertisements about that, right? Now, what happened was a teenage girl started Googling what happens when I get pregnant, and Walmart started sending maternity things just to the address that they had on file. The girl's dad flipped out, called Walmart, yelled at them. Walmart actually issued an apology. He went to the media, etc. Three months later, the girl came clean and told her dad that she actually was pregnant. So Walmart knew that this guy's daughter was pregnant before he knew. That's how companies are starting to use this information. Now, is that a good or a bad thing? How much information should a bank have about you in deciding whether or not to issue you credit or a mortgage? Maybe you think more information is beneficial after all, right? You know, uh, that would make it more accurate. I want to I want to start by kind of teasing out two different themes. One is risk-based pricing, which is the idea that commensurate with your risk, you should be offered an interest rate or a fair point. Now, most people kind of say they're for that abstractly, right? The alternative to that is cross-subsidization, in which two people, in which you blend your aggregate risk, and the riskier person gets a better deal than they otherwise would, the safer person gets a less good deal. That's more fair, right? That's a little bit more equitable. In society, we have a deeply inconsistent view about when we should preface risk-based pricing and when we should preface uh, um, cross-subsidization. Right? So I'm going to give you a couple different examples and you guys can come back and forth and, and say whether or not you think it's a, it's a good idea or a bad idea. And I'm going to do it specific to financial t services. And I'm going to start 
with this interesting thing, which is Mac or PC users. Okay? Who here, who here uses a PC? Okay. Who here uses a Mac? Okay. You guys are better credit risks. All else, controlling for all other factors, income, age, credit score, whatever you want to do, it's been told to me, and, and I believe it, that about uh, Mac users show up repeatedly as about a five basis point better deal. Well, they, they, spent, they chose to spend more on their computer, even controlling for income. Now, when you go online, the other side knows if you have a Mac or a PC, they know it instantly. You can't really fake it, right? Do you think Mac users should get a better credit rate? So I'll tell you something. Mac users are also wealthier. Home Depot decided to charge Mac users more when they went on their website. <laughs> now that's legal. It is completely legal to price discriminate. In fact, some other travel, I think Orbit, some other travel places, you know, you guys, when you book a, a, an airline or a hotel flight, you can see those prices change when you go back, right? They're tracking you. They're using that data to see how much you want and they're, they're moving their price. How many of you think that it's, it should be allowable to charge Mac PC users a higher credit rate. Show of hands. Okay. How many of you think that's wrong? Right. So it, it and then there's a few. It depends. It depends on what. On whether or not they're paying their fair share in the form of a universal basic income through a VAT tax. Okay, that's that. That's a very long and specific <laughs> point. Um, I, I would say that the question becomes here. By the way, most people would say it would be illegal to do that on a credit because credit is governed by something called the Equal Credit Opportunity Act passed in the 1970s with a lot of other strong consumer protection laws like truth in lending. Uh, and under that, you are not allowed to charge uh, on the basis of a protected class which includes race, gender, marital status, which I'll get back to in a little bit, and a couple other uh, uh, factors. Your computer is not one of the factors. However, your computer is highly correlated with race. Macs are owned much more by white people. And so if you used Mac versus PC, you, what you would find is white people are getting disproportionately a much better credit deal. And so if somebody were to challenge a bank for doing that legally, it is not clear the bank would win. In other words, the person suing the bank for using Mac could, could make a very strong case that it has something called disparate impact. That's the legal framework under which your question of whether or not you're proxying for race. And the bank's internal lawyer would probably tell the bank, don't use that factor because if you get sued, you may lose. Now, whether a new financial technology company that's kind of less regulated, less of an incumbent, right? Uber didn't go around all the taxi cab commissions and say, is it okay for us to provide this service, right? They just did it. But this Mac versus PC thing, it's a bit of a gray area. Most, you know, it hasn't been fully done in large part because people are afraid of being sued. That being said, there's a cross subsidization, right? Nobody knows why Mac users are better credit risks. We'll turn into some of those questions a little bit later in the, in the talk. But there are a couple other issues. How many of you think that we should charge men and women different interest rates? Women are better credit risks. Anybody think we should just look at your gender? Anybody? So we're for cross-subsidization, right? Men are riskier. So we're gonna, we're gonna have a society where women subsidize men in another form. There are many forms. This would be another one. Now, you don't really have to answer that question in terms of a loan because it is blatantly illegal. Clear as day. That's a loan. Let's talk about another financial product that most people in this room have. Who here has car insurance? Right? Who here had a teenage kid on their car insurance? A little price difference between a boy and a girl? A pretty big price difference. When you are 16 and you start driving, the only thing the car company knows about you, right? You have no auto history, but they don't know. Maybe they know your grades a little bit, but they know your gender. And the actuarial tables are very clear. Teenage boys 
wreck cars. And we as a society, in most states, not all, by the way, not all states allow this, but most states allow you to gender segregate on, on car insurance, which is you know, a, a pretty important financial product because they've decided it's not fair. Why should teenage women subsidize teenage boys' bad driving? They should pay their fair share. Ah, we live in a society. We would like to think that our society views discrimination consistently across different types of products, particularly just within the narrow world of financial services, right? We're not even going to talk about selling goods at Home Depot's website. But from this example, you see just looking at gender, one type of financial product allows that type of pricing and use, and another doesn't. What does this have to do with technology, you might ask? Well, it has a lot to do with technology because the ability to underwrite and make these decisions by computers are coming up with all this new data through big data, machine learning, and eventually artificial intelligence in which they're going to uncover these same truth. Right? The same truth that if you gave the machine all the car crashes, the machine would figure out that teenage boys are particularly risky. If you gave them all the data on who defaults on loans, they'd figure out the gender differences. If you gave them the data on macros, we see they'd figure this out. How will they use it? How will we tell them not to use it? What are proxies that functionally serve the same underlying situations, but ultimately we would not want to have be allowed? And this is the big time front. When you were only underwriting on four or five or a small number of finite variables, we had control of the situation. When you give the computer all the data and information, we don't. And so this is going to be coming in, and it's not entirely clear how we're going to do it. So let me try to make this very, very concrete. I'm going to go to my favorite financial technology paper um, uh, from this woman named Manju Puri, who's a professor at Duke. And she took something using actual data from a company called Wayfair. Do you guys know Wayfair? It's like European Amazon. She took a bunch of things. So in Germany, you could be on Wayfair and you could decide whether or not you were going to buy a product. And then Wayfair would, and you'd apply for credit, right? And Wayfair would have to decide whether or not to give you money. So she took, so what would they do? They would pull up your credit score, right? Everybody here know what a FICO credit score is, okay? I'm going to tell you something about your credit score. Look to your left and see the next two people, and look to your right and see the next two people. One of the five of you has something wrong on your credit score. Your credit report has a material error that has a significant impact on your credit. Could be good, could be bad. Mine is that there was an Aaron Klein in New Jersey who didn't pay his cell phone bill, and it's forever on my credit score. So if you're watching Aaron Klein in New Jersey, um, <laughs> please pay AT&T. I can't convince them to take it off even though I've had AT&T for 20 years. But this material error on your credit report doesn't really matter in the sense that the, credit, the goal of the credit bureau is not to be accurate. The goal of the credit bureau is to sell your credit score and make money. <laughs> and accuracy is expensive. But selling all of your data is revenue, right? One is a cost, one is a revenue. There's no requirement that, that your credit report be accurate. There's no legal requirement. The only legal requirement is if you dispute it, they have to ask the person who has your debt. And so the third party debt collector who bought the $1,000 that Aaron Klein didn't pay on his cell phone bill says, yes, I own this debt and it's, a, it's an Aaron Klein who lived in New Jersey. Right? Never forget about that it's me. The credit bureau says, oh, I don't have to do anything. I've checked it. So there's no, right? This situation is rife with errors. I'm going to close on, on this on credit reports, but it's important. Anybody here playing an orchestra? So if you go to an orchestra, what'd you play? Trumpet. Trumpet. So when you sit down in the orchestra, what, do you, what did you tune to? Do you remember? Uh, Who plays the A that you tuned to? Low brass. So, so, so the full orchestra, when you go to an orchestra and you hear, they're tuning to the oboe's A. 
Now, why the oboe's A? You may say, well, the oboe plays the best A. A true A is a 440. It's the musical represent, it's a numeric representation of the frequency. No, the truest A is a concertmaster violinist. So why would you tune to the oboe? Answer, the oboe is the hardest instrument to tune. So if the oboe is a little bit flat and is playing a 438, the whole orchestra will play a 438. And unless you have perfect pitch, you probably won't hear it. If the oboe was at a 438 and everybody else was at a 440, it, you would hear the oboe and it would sound off. What is that analogy? The analogy is important because the credit scores are a really out of tune oboe that all of society has tuned to. And it doesn't matter because everything is in harmony and in tune and this threatens to disrupt it. So, what threat, so Wayfair made all these loans. Okay, these are the lo how the loans reported, right? Who defaulted and who didn't based on how predictive you should be, right? You should predict some amount of people. This woman, Manjupuri, took all this big data that she had about these actual Wayfair customers and she created a machine learning environment, not true artificial intelligence, but she wanted to optimize on something called digital footprint. That is things Wayfair knows about you. And she d and to see, could I beat, in terms of accuracy and predictive, German FICO? And she did. That second line is just, so this is showing that she's slightly more predictive down here all the way up to the top of the curve. So what did she use? She used five variables. Ready? Time of day, Mac or PC. Remember, this is Germany, so they have different laws about what you can or can't use for underwriting. Phone, I, uh, tablet, or desktop. <clears throat> is your name in your email? These are Wayfair customers. And domain name. Hint, Gmails are a lot better credit risk than Hotmail. Those five variables with a specific weight, the computer was able to look at actual loans and on the basis of those five variables be more predictive about who was, would or wouldn't default. These are five things that Wayfair knows instantaneously and for free. Two things that are not true about your credit score, which they have to pull. Now, if you right, are concerned, if you really wanted to optimize for accuracy, you'd use them both. So not only does it beat it if you just trash the credit score, if you brought them together, you get even more accurate information. Now, let's return to these five things. How many of those five things are allowable in a U.S. legal framework without having a disparate impact on one of the protected classes? We've covered Mac versus PC. Uh, in terms of phone, desktop, right? Huge proxy. Huge proxy for race. Minorities are far more likely to use smartphones or only have access to the internet through smartphones. Right? Also a proxy for class of job, desktop, People tend to have access to uh, desktop computers, other types of, of career folk don't. Uh, is your name in your email? Proxy for race. There are a lot of reasons why my email includes my name. I have had a series of historical experiences which make that make sense for me. There's a paper by an economist, Marianne Bertrand, who took two identical resumes and put one a very white sounding name and one a clearly African American sounding name or a Latino name and sent them out for job interviews. I think we can guess what you saw next. In fact, she w did the experiment where she kept upping the, the education level of the minority candidate to see when they would get callbacks, right? You could understand why people with very ethnically identifiable names may choose a very different email, particularly about spelling, particularly about their identity, right? And so, probably not. Probably not. Time of day? Maybe, right? The, the intuition there is if you're buying stuff on credit at three in the morning from Amazon, you may be more likely to default, <laughs> right? But what if you work second shift, right? What, why is, you know, in the aggregate this holds true, not always in the individual, right? Everybody who's shopping at 3 a.m. isn't to default. Should you be penalized? Should you have a higher interest rate? Should you be denied credit 
because the algorithm says you're mimicking behavior that other people see as risky. Right? This is the kind of core question that we're going through um, as the computer starts to come up with other things. This was really only, I would argue, possible because you were in a machine learning environment. Right? I don't think all of the smartest people in the room could have come up and guessed those five variables. Name in your email as a binary yes, no? That one shocked me. Right? By the way, age is another protected variable which also correlates with domain name. Right? Some of the, at AOL, <laughs> at Yahoo, anybody here at Yahoo? Little bit of a correlation there, right? Okay, so. What, what does the score mean? What, is, what, uh, what does the graph mean? So, 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 percentages, what do they mean? Well, so these are standardized error rates, and so if you were going to, the vertical line is access, if you were, the higher up on the curve is the more accurate you are in terms of predicting their default, right? So if I make 100 loans, the goal isn't that 100 loans all pay back. If I've made 100 loans and nobody's defaulted, my lending parameters are too tight, right? You want to have a, a, a little bit of <coughs> default and risk, right? Because then you're marginally missing on that. And so as they're making these loans, they're judging how likely am I. Right, so this is, a, this is a combination of the ratio of how likely did you think that person was to default to begin with and how likely did they actually end up defaulting. Right, so you end up penalizing some people with low credit scores who overperform. Right, so one of the things in the US context is important to know is the single biggest variable for most people in their credit score is number of years you've had a credit score. That is deeply correlated with age, protected class. But credit scores have somehow achieved this grandfathered status in which they've been decided that the risk-based pricing information they provide is so valuable and can't be achieved other ways that they're an industry norm and standard and allowed. You are never going to successfully sue someone for denying you credit because they checked your credit score and that you had a low credit score or giving you a higher rate. Under the law, if I deny you credit, I have to tell you why. This becomes very interesting as it relates to the use of artificial intelligence. It has to be the truth. Well, <laughs> usually if you're being denied credit, it's for a variety of reasons, right? It's not just one thing. But let's assume, uh, let me ask you this, does anybody here know the two leading reasons why people default? I'll give you a fact, 83%, well, this is a stat I've not been able to track down, but everybody says it on the talking head circuit. 83% of Americans have never defaulted on a loan. Less than half of Americans are considered prime consumers. About 40% of Americans are subprime and, and, and almost 20% are unscored, not in the system. But anyways, you're about to, to, to two, two reasons why you default, Le top two leading cases. Hmm? Lost, your job. Lost your job is not, is not one. Isn't that it? top two reasons? Yep, health, medical expense, and divorce. Those are the two leading drivers of default and bankruptcy. So let's start with medical expense. People here think your medical information is super private, right? We have HIPAA. I blew out my I blew out my left shoulder, uh, and I tried to get a second opinion. And so I, you know, I'd gotten an MRI, and I wanted to get the. In order for me to get my MRI from one doctor to another. I had to get it printed out on a CD, drive, pick up this CD, go to the, somebody else and pray they actually had a CD-ROM holder, right? That's how private this information is. I don't know why. I'm happy to put that image on the web and crowdsource, <laughs> right? My goal is to get as many qualified opinions on whether or not I needed surgery or rehab. But the law keeps this information super private. Do you think your bank could tell whether or not you had a health issue? Right? All of a sudden you start seeing co-payments. All of a sudden you start going to CVS. Think about the digital trail you leave everywhere you swipe. Think about what you Google. Right? Google, you know, prostate cancer stage three, and you're a 55-year-old man, and you've just had three medical co-payments. Do you think the computer could come to, and by the way, the computer doesn't have to be right. Now. Here's an interesting question. Should they? 
are they allowable, right? Is that information, right? If you are gonna default on a loan, right, the whole purpose of the risk-based pricing regime is that you should pay commensurate with your risk. Is that, at what level is that allowable? And what, sir, right, we're guarding all this information in one privacy regime, but HIPAA doesn't apply to this whole other regime. And if the computer figures it out, like the 16-year-old pregnant girl maybe even before she told, are they going to mail you something? We think you're sick, right? Think about those types of questions in terms of your privacy. But it's incredibly important that you be told why you're denied credit, also in part to keep a track record to keep the person honest. Why did we require in law that they tell you why you're denied credit? Because before you had computers underwriting, you had just a bank branch manager, right? Or an individual or a person, and it would often be discrimination, right? In all sorts of forms. I remember I said marriage is a protected class. It was because unmarried women were being denied credit or charged a higher rate all through the 50s and 60s, right? If you were a single working woman, they would look at you, you know, where's your husband to co-sign? What, you don't have one? No, 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 right? So we have all these protected classes for good reason. We have this paper trail where you have to say why, but now we have these privacy concerns, particularly as this amount of data and information becomes available, digestible, and usable. And while we can proxy and control in the machine learning experiment, we know what those five variables are. In the artificial intelligence, we're not entirely sure sometimes. We don't know why the computer did go 37, went, move 37 when it did. We know it worked, and we know the computer had never seen that move in recorded Go human history because nobody had ever made that move because it was so blatantly stupid that it took the computer to figure out to get outside of our credit box. So, I'm going to do another thought experiment here. And this button represents your ability to transform all cars to being self-driving. And you can choose to press this button or not. And before you do that, I want to give you a piece of information. In this thought experiment, if you press this button and all cars become immediately self-driving, this year there'll be 10,000 deaths. Technology is not foolproof. The scanners don't always work. Who here wants to press the button? All right. You guys want to press and you guys don't. Why do you want to press? Because uh, I know they're a lot safer than human drivers. Bingo. That's how many people die driving. If I told you pressing that button would reduce auto fatalities by 70%, would you be more inclined to press the button? Same, f same fact. No, no, because the car will go the speed limit 55. <laughs> <laughs> you look at the freaking back and the distance between the cars, it'll make the functioning of the system dysfunctional. Perhaps, but on a purely safety perspective, right? And you can, you can, on a purely safety perspective, the question becomes, and we as humans are very, very much onto this, what's your starting frame? Abstractly, we want zero deaths, right? In reality, driving is risky. It's probably the riskiest thing most people do on a daily basis. And it's an underappreciated risk. Every single time a Tesla on auto drive crashes, there's a news story about it. How many of those 37,000 people made the nightly news, made national news? Right, this number is way in decline, by the way. Cars have become way safer. Yes? It's a 10,000 figure hypothetical. hypothetical. Made it up completely out of whole cloth. But I made it up to... They haven't, they haven't run... The, Correct. They haven't run self-driving cars in traffic coming to Las no. Vegas on a Friday afternoon <laughs> <laughs> from, from Los Angeles. They, 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 they haven't, but they have run humans doing that. But my point to you is when the technology gets to the place, whether it's now or down the road, where it's better than people but not perfect, are we willing to live with it? And that is a difficult question. And I posit to you, a lot of it depends on what, where you start, right? The same, if, if you would have said no to 10,000 deaths, but yes to 70% decline, there's an inconsistency. Much like there's an inconsistency we have in a society where I can't price discriminate on your credit card interest rate 
because of your gender, but I can on your car insurance payment. But we're giving, we're giving up control. I mean, we're, we're sitting in a mechanical box and we're praying that the box we're in doesn't crash. We like to believe, yep. rightly or wrongly, that when we're mm -hmm. driving, we're in control of our, our situation. So, and it's that other idiot on the other highway that's right. going to have the crash. So two things on that. One is... So you want to flip a coin and take a chance with your life? Or just take it in your own hands and say, I can control it. So I'm going to flip, I flipped that coin yesterday when I flew out here in a big metal box <laughs> with somebody else. And by the way, do you think the pilot was flying the plane the whole time? No. Have you guys seen the great strides in aviation safety? Right? The computer's flying the plane. Right? The people are there so that you're a little more relaxed. Right? And the computers are way safer. I mean, I, I remember... I mean, there are lots of plane crashes in the 80s, right? I think there's been one fatality of a person in aviation in the last 10 years in the U.S. on a U.S. on a U.S. plane, right? This, the, um, and so this illusion of control. Although, keep in mind, by the way, right? When you're driving, it, you can be fine if the person rear ends you, right? There's nothing you can do, right? This illusion of control. But it's the same thing in finance and risk-based pricing. You like to think that you can control your credit score because you're going to behave in a responsible way. You're going to do all these right things, right? You're not going to have an Aaron Klein who runs up a thousand dollar cell phone and gets put on your thing, right. right? You're not going to, but that's not, when they're pulling your credit file, right? And by the way, I encourage everybody here, you can get a free credit report, <laughs> right? Right? Free. I helped write that law, the FACT Act, uh, uh, the Fair and Accurate Credit Transaction Act of 2003 that put that in there. By the way, they try to sell you something on top of that. They fought. When we were writing that law, the industry fought saying it was going to be free. Oh, that's a big cost. We're going to have to comply and send all these people. It turned out to be one of their biggest revenue sources. Because then they're like, oh, yeah, we'll give you this free thing. But for $9.99 a month, we'll sell you monitoring. And we'll give you that. They have to give you your report, not your score. Those are two different things. But the report is the data underlying it. That data is filled with errors. Often these are errors outside of your control that you can't fix, right? Most of your credit score, let me be very clear, most of your credit score is within your control, right? Just like a lot of your safety, but not all of it. And where we, where we start our framework happens to govern our choices because we want an ideal world with no discrimination. So that's a very important uh, uh, and very insightful comment about the inherent distinction between banks and insurance. They're kind of like, uh, in some ways, very different financial transactions. But the real reason why the law is different is one's federal and one's state. Everybody's right. We have state-based insurance risk pools. We have state regulation of insurance. Insurance is not federally regulated. And so most states started allowing gender segregation. And a few that tried, there was a bit of a political backlash. Women said, why are we cross-subsidizing men? And they went back to being where they were. Whereas federally, you can imagine a member of Congress saying, you should not discriminate on the basis of gender. Right? That, that ought to poll pretty well here. Right? That, and so these federal laws went in on banking. Because banking being federally regulated has a very unique perspective. And I'm trying to draw out within this financial services world, right? It's very important, but so is your health, right? HIPAA, we have a whole privacy regime under HIPAA. We have a different privacy regime for banking, uh, something called the Gramm-Leach-Bliley Act. You know how you get those, those really useful disclosures in the mail, <laughs> right? This is an example of how disclosure and certain regulatory failures, but that's a subject for another lecture of another day. But here, I, I, I'm setting this up because I want to close by offering you guys a perspective on how we ought to think about this going forward. And my perspective, right, I'm an unusual economist because you see all four quadrants of this, of this graph, not just the little one, um, starts with the origin. And the origin in this thought experiment is the status quo, the current system we have, the out of tune oboe that works. Right? We make credit allocations throughout our society, how predictive they are or aren't, 
I don't know, but it works. Okay, and then I want you to imagine if you go up the y-axis, this becomes more predictive, less predictive, more biased, less biased. Okay, so let's start with what's simple, right? If you're more biased than the status quo and less predictive, you're just bad, right? The market shouldn't want you because you're less predictive. Public policy shouldn't want you because you're more biased. And we shouldn't have to spend too much time because these problems should take care of themselves. If you are more predictive and less biased, I would argue that's a win-win, right? Now, it may not mean zero bias, right? We're not going to have zero fatalities, but it's less biased. So let me give you an example of that, and it's called cash flow underwriting. So I look in your bank account, and I see how much money you had at the beginning and end of, your, of every week for the last two years. And on the basis of that, I decide whether or not to give you a loan. Studies have shown that this new technology, which previously was not really available in order to get access to your account online, to do all of this instantaneously and cost effectively, but now with uh, APIs and, and certain technology companies can do this, particularly if you give them login credentials, that seems to be more predictive and less biased. Obviously income is correlated with race and class and all this, but like Income feels to me like a fair thing to decide whether or not to give you credit, even understanding that it's tied to all these other areas. That's a win-win, but there are other technologies about this, but it's not clear that's allowable, right? Getting back to this Mac versus PC. How many of you here think we can use Mac versus PCs okay? No? Depends, yeah, okay, some people. Those who think it's not, okay, so most people are still a little bit Undecided? What if I said whether or not you watch the Hallmark Channel, BET, <laughs> Univision? These are proxies. Well, it's all about them using your data, and I think I said it depends because it's like, what are you getting in exchange for your? You're, data? you're getting credit. Somebody's making, going to price you a better deal. You're getting a cheaper interest rate. You're getting a lower insurance payment, so right? On one end of it. Yeah. Perhaps, right? Permission to our data, though. Well. So, uh, that's a very good question, right? Have you given permission? Who here would want to give up their real-time location to one of the largest companies on earth at all times? Yeah, who here uses Google Maps? All of, if you use Google Maps, you have just given Google all your location information. I do it because I want to know is 14th Street or 16th Street faster to go home? get a share of every Google search is what I'm saying. Well, I mean, I'm okay with it. What we find with our privacy, it's an important question, and economists struggle with this because it's the difference between stated and revealed preference. So stated preference, do you value your privacy? Yes. Revealed preference, I share my privacy to find out which way I can save two minutes on my yes. thing. Yeah. This le economists are really bad at this. We assume those two things are the same in this rational actor model. It is why you can get huge political supports about things like, I own my data, data is my right, because that's people's stated preference, and huge political support for allowing people to give away their data for nothing because they get all these good, or nothing is the wrong word, but they get all these things. And so if you really went into this super data permission thing and Google Maps stopped working, I think the politician or the bureaucrat who changed the rules to stop Google Maps would have a bit of a tough time on their hands the next morning when the whole system crashes because of that person. The state and reveal preference is a tricky issue as it relates to privacy. But let's get back here, right? Because we have a win-win, we have bad. These two boxes, I think, are very interesting. And let's start in quadrant two. More predictive, but more biased, right? This is where the market is going to take us, right? The market wants to know, are you going to default on your loan or not, right? The market may or may not care how biased things are from a legal perspective. They may be looking for ways around or proxies in this space. And this is a trade-off. Right? If I've uncovered something about you that makes you a riskier behavior, maybe you should. If I uncover something about you that makes you safer and lowers your rate, gives you access to credit or access to a product, but it's pretty discriminatory. Should we allow that? Right? This is difficult, and this is going to be a source where policy is going to have to engage. This is another difficult choice. We're going to make our system less predictive, less efficient, but fairer. 
Do we as a society want to do that? Right? More cross-subsidization. Who here thinks that we should be able to use your genetic code to see whether or not you have a proclivity for cancer in pricing your health insurance? Probably not most of you. In fact, it's illegal. That's how much that polls. But it's predictive. <laughs> so we're going to cross-subsidize people who are more likely to get sick. Now if you choose to smoke or start smoking or maybe it wasn't your choice to begin with, you're going to pay more because we allow that behavior, right? So if you're more likely to get lung cancer because of your choice of a habit but not your choice of genetics, right? This is a question for society to debate and these are the questions where I think policymakers need to weigh in. On the, top, on the second quadrant, because that's where the market is going to be taking us, and on the bottom quadrant, because as this data becomes more available, norms of fairness, right, social moral compasses need to weigh in. But we have not developed a system designed for this amount of data and information. Instead, it's designed for very simple boxes, right? that can be very easily governed and looked in a 1970s era framework, assuming 1970s or maybe 1980s technology. And this new coming technological wave is going to radically transform these opportunities and people are going to take advantage of it. Because, and the question is, is that going to be in a good way? Because the current system, as I've tried to, and I'm happy to go, really is discriminatory, really has problems, but how far do we want to go down a risk-based pricing regime? How much do you want to empower the machines versus how much do we empower and set up our rules? I'll close with this and then we'll turn to questions. I would like a little consistency. It irks me intellectually as a policy person that gender is allowed to price discriminate in insurance and not allowed in credit. Either we should treat, it should be non-discriminatory in the same class across. But as somebody who has federal versus state, I certainly don't want to have to pay higher car insurance because as a proud Marylander, I know Virginians and Delawareans are worse drivers. <laughs> and I am happy to be brought and segregated on that and happy to let Maryland's perspective. I'll close with this, which is that in my car insurance, my rates went up. I won't get into <laughs> whose accidents. <laughs> uh, and I said to them, I said, you know, God, I've been a loyal customer with you guys for a long time. Can, is there anything we can do here, right? My, yes, I know these were accidents. They're on the record. Woman goes, you know, uh, woman goes, well, let me try something. She goes, you can ask me to pull your credit score. And on the basis of your credit score, we can underwrite you in a different bucket. Will you give me permission to do that? Permission data. And I said, if this will save me 15% on my car insurance in 15 minutes or less, <laughs> I will gladly give you that permission. And lo and behold, it did. It saved me quite a bit of money. Now, should I pay less in car insurance? Am I any less risky, or anybody on my policy, less risky a driver than all the accidents they saw happen over the preceding 20 years I've had this car insurance policy? But because the computer and algorithm sees somebody with my family profile and sees our credit, it assumes that we're a better driver than our track record and correspondingly lowers our rate. Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? By the way, if I'm paying less in but causing damage, right, there's a little bit of a zero-sum game, right? Somebody's paying more, right? So um, with that, let me pause and, and uh, open up for questions, sir. Okay, so between the two systems, mm -hmm. uh, what you're really dealing with is the issue of bias and what bias you're willing to accept right. and what you're not. And, and the idea that, that we're not going to have any bias is unreal. The, the, there's historical, right? We all have bias from the moment we're born. We all have a genetic code, right? Some people inherit a lot of money. Some people very little. And so the discussion on the social level has to be what bias can we identify that we're facing 
decisions on. And so when the machines are creating their AI move 37, yep. that we don't understand, how do we articulate what the bias is? It's, it's very, it is very difficult. We can do backdating testing to see how predictive it is and how much it correlates with these disparate impact questions, but it becomes very hard. I don't think Macs are targeted to white people. I've seen their advertising. I don't think owning a Mac is a proxy for race. That's a personal opinion of mine. The facts are they're disproportionately white. Now, television, magazine subscriptions, there are lots of ways you can proxy for race. Name and email. But some, we have a framework, a legal framework called disparate impact, which says essentially if you're showing a very disparate impact across one of the protected classes from your proxy and you cannot find a better variable that can perform as well with less of a racial category, you are, you, you are precluded from using that. And you can be sued as an incumbent player for you introducing that new element. The result of that framework is a lot of inertia around the status quo. Everybody just wants to be in tune. Make the loan, move on, right? If that means only less than half of Americans are prime credits and everybody pays more in interest, and very few people default, eh, good for us, right? The competition that flows in the market isn't going to come through. Well, I'll give you two facts um, on your credit score. If you make a mortgage payment, it gets recorded. If you make a rent payment, it usually doesn't. But they've started to change. Starting very slowly, but you know, the majority, I think half of all rentals are, are, are small landlords, one to four rental units. It's like, right, they're not going to be reporting, right? That's a bias to the system. Right? Who owns their home and has a mortgage? Wealthier people in general than renters. And they're continually building credit. But both people are doing the same thing, right? The first of the month making a payment for their shelter. Right? There are biases in this system. One, two, and three. I have a question about the data. So back to the Mac and PC mm -hmm. It, so what would be done to the model to fix that? Well, the, the model is capturing reality, right. right? So the model's doing its job, which is trying to figure out who's going to default or not, right? The structural problems in our society that begat those cycles is a different issue. Let me be clear. <laughs> what, the, what, what the data show are that Macs are owned disproportionately by whites, and that controlling for income and other variables Right? I believe max are sl slightly improve your credit profile, about five basis points, 0.05% is, is plus or minus. It's a very, very, very slight thing. But we're constantly fine tuning, right? If you could pay, th if somebody offered you a credit card at 15% and somebody offered you a credit card at 14.95% and everything else was the same, which would you pick? So that's the, the question is what do you want in terms of these predictions, right? This is not going to solve the structural on fairness, right? Men make more than women, similarly skilled people. There's a gender pay gap, right? We can't price discriminate, but we can't income discriminate, right? The more money you make, the more credit you should be able to get. Risk-based pricing makes sense. So the, you, you can't fully pick up for all of that. You know, sir, we're talking a lot about like, the policy implications and like, whether or not we can control these things. Um, it, in terms of like, big data mm -hmm. and uh, a lot about these like, kind of permissions that you're asking for, is it even worth protecting our data when companies can like like you're talking about just like ask for permission or they can like restrict their services because you're not giving them permission to like access their data so in terms of data access it's really you know there are emails companies that tell you they won't read your email Google doesn't tell you that I have Gmail it's a really good system <laughs> Right? Does it bother me that, you know, if I, if I email a question to my wife, hey, should we take the kids to Disneyland? And, uh, you know, all of a sudden then the banner ads. Yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, that, we, we see that. You see that on Facebook, right? People make these choices. I, I don't think people are making these choices about Google reading your email, 
right? But people sign up for Gmail, and then they tell you they don't want companies reading your email. Uh, right. And then you. Is it uh, in the lower right-hand quadrant of the fair system? Yep. Basically, that implies situations with more government regulation. Uh, regulation or legislation? Legislation. That's right. Like, so, we don't need to regulate, right? Given, yes. Given the... Because the, the market wants predictive. The market doesn't care about fair. Given the time that it takes to generate that legislation and the, the uh, uh, non-responsiveness of change of that legislation, um, and given the, the improvement in AI over time, it would seem to me that you're going to end up with uh, situations where AI is defined systems that perhaps even could take things up to the, the upper right, uh, left-hand corner, and legislation is going to keep the system uh, down in the, the lower right-hand corner. So, so this, th this is part of the concern that I'm raising when I'm describing this existing, right? Because we don't start with nothing, right? We start with this with this hodgepodge of regulation, predominantly from the 70s when there was a strong consumer movement in Congress for things like the Equal Credit Opportunity Act and the uh, Fair Credit Reporting Act and other pieces of legislation. <clears throat> and this puts in certain rules, right, because there's one other layer on this, which is incumbents and non-incumbents, right? Big existing banks are gonna tread more carefully because they don't wanna get sued and they have giant legal compliance operations. Small new online startups are going to try and figure it out. I was in a meeting once with these fintech entrepreneurs and a group of government regulators. And this woman was describing this company. It's a really cool company to help uh, single parents with managed child support. And the regulator goes, I think you're a money transmitter. Are you, state, are you licensed? To be a money transmitter, you have to be licensed and it's a state-based license. There's no federal license. So you need it in all 50 states. And the woman goes, no. She goes, well, you gotta be careful. You could be fined about that. And the entrepreneur turns to the regulator who thinks they've just scared them and goes, the day you find me, I will go to my venture capitalist and we'll pop a bottle of champagne. And this shook the regulator, right? I mean, like they brandished their badge and said, you know, be careful. <laughs> what do you mean you're gonna pop? She said, the day you find me means that my company is big enough that we've made it. That was her mindset as an entrepreneur, and right? Uber, getting back, right? Uber got fined a lot, they had a bunch of problems, blah, 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 but they made it. And so there's another dimension between these two different boxes within this, which, within the market structure. But ultimately, yes. Ultimately, I think your, your point or query or criticism, which is that you know, government can be slow. It can also move very fast when there's a big public scandal. Right? These data breaches don't seem to have triggered anything. But at some point, if there's a big enough scandal in one of these things, right? We got rid of this, we prohibited as a society genetic, using your genetic code for your insurance far before the computing technology allowed for 23andMe, right? At one point, this is one of these standard things uh, that the, all the technologists at the presentations I go to, you know, the, the cost of sequencing one human genome in, in 1990, 2000, right? So, so in face of scandal or threat, they can move pretty fast sometimes. But maybe I'm just being biased because I worked on the Senate Banking Committee when we passed TARP, which was kind of a big deal during the financial crisis and I didn't sleep for a month. <laughs> so um, I believe there are companies in China. Oh, I'll get back to you. There yeah. companies in China who's, who are already doing these things. They're looking at thousands of data points. And you know, they don't have a racial like, discrimination like they do, but they have a social credit system that they also plug in. So do you think we would be, like America or the US would be like kind of, kind of look at China to see how they're handling it and like start adopting their model going forward? It's very interesting. If you were, were here, um, when I gave my talk last semester, I talked a lot about the Chinese payment system, which also has their kind of WeChat social credit score. And by the way, you know, the concept of credit as a social collective thing is an old concept in the West. Anybody here a member of a credit union? Yeah, 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 I am, right, it's U.S. Senate Federal Credit Union. Credit unions were a German concept about a common bond in which once upon a time it was actually hard to be a credit union, you actually had to have a common bond, we can 
story for another day how they can offer great rates for everyone. But in this credit union, the idea was you wouldn't default, right? They had no underwriting, they had no credit, they couldn't pull up your FICO or any of this. But if we all were coworkers together, if we all lived in the same community, there's a social pressure not to default. And that was gonna be a more common thing than, you know, sorry, bank, whatever, not gonna make your payment. In China's gone back to that a little bit with an online system. And we use social credit scoring, right? Uber, what's your star rating? If you guys saw that Black Mirror where they did that, sorry. So you could learn some of that, but you want to talk about discrimination and bias, right? And you get that type of system, there are a lot of concerns about who's rating you, who's regulating that, and on what level you're being, rate, you're being rated. I'm seeing, I think, does this mean? I hate to do this as usual, especially tonight. I just want to be respectful of your time. Uh, so to close up sort of the formal part of the evening, but Aaron, I hope, first right. of all, thank you for a fascinating. My pleasure. Thank you for your great questions and comments. And Aaron will be around if we didn't have time to get to your question. Uh, so, so come on up. And I hope we can see you at, at our next lecture, which will not be until uh, April 22nd, uh, a slightly different topic. Our colleague Vonda Felbab brown will be out. Vonda is a foreign policy expert who travels to some of the most dangerous places in the world to do policy research. She will, at that point, have just gotten back from her latest trip to Afghanistan and will be talking to us about what she thinks of the future of U.S.-Afghan relations. So if you can join us, please come. Thank you again. Thank you.